So thank you, Mena and Zina, for organising this panel. Um, I'm going to start by kind of talking about what I thought I was going to be talking about um, <laughs> back in September when I wrote down a few things and I was like, yeah, that seems reasonable. I can talk about um, ownership of the past. I can talk about um, working with a criminalised community. Um, I can very easily talk about um, the reluctance of institutions to take part in any kind of research that is perceived as politically risky. Um, but so my, my work is with the Kurdish diaspora community in London, which I'm hoping to branch out to other places in Europe as well. Um, but what happened in October is um, an invasion um, into northern Syria by the Turkish state. Um, and I'm not going to get all geopolitical, but just as a very kind of brief grounding, um, the Kurdish people in in the Middle East um, are spread across four different states, um, Turkey, Syria, Iraq and Iran, um, and have faced genocide and um, extreme forms of oppression in all those four different states. And following the start of the Syrian civil war and the kind of crumbling of the Assad regime, the northern parts of Syria, which had been uh, very Kurdish area um, basically took matters into their own hands and formed um, a kind of semi-autonomous region in the area. And you might have seen um, especially um, photos of women fighters in the Kurdish forces because they've been here as kind of the feminist heroes who are defeating Islamic State um, in the region. So that's been the kind of very popular Western narrative um, on the northern Syria. But essentially, the invasion has had huge reverberations um, in the Kurdish diaspora community across Europe. And in the UK, um, a lot of that kind of energy has gone into organising protests, um, various kind of lobbying work, um, and also all this kind of different forms of grassroots organising in kind of local um, constituencies and trade unions and that involves a lot of a huge amount of um, kind of working hours for people involved um, and I've been taking part in that quite a lot over the last few months um, and it's so I was basically thinking about this in terms of if we as archaeologists work with marginalized communities these kind of moments of crisis are going to happen um, because we're working with marginalised communities, these crises are just more likely to, to occur, but then also their repercussions are going to be usually far more serious for the people we're working with than they would to a more kind of established, less precarious and less marginalised community. Um, so in terms of, so basically what I'm going to be talking about is ideas of solidarity and mutual aid in archaeological research and the kind of blurring of boundaries between the role of the kind of researcher or archaeologist and then what we also do as people who care about these communities and who care about the people that we're working with. Um, so essentially, I started, I took on, well, I, my engagement with the Kurdish community began through um, political organising, so I didn't enter those spaces as an archaeologist. That's kind of something that I brought in subsequently. So I had a very different relationship with, with the Kurdish diaspora community in London um, than I would have had otherwise. And it was maybe easier for me to make these decisions about what to prioritise than it would have been if my engagement were kind of purely from a research perspective. But essentially, um, I started doing this kind of more kind of organising focused work um, which I think is integral to my research, not as, as a method of data collection, I'm not kind of mining information as I'm doing it. Um, and it's not just also an attempt to kind of smooth my way into certain trust networks, um, but it's more um, like a fundamental kind of engagement and embedding into that community and taking responsibility for what is happening beyond my own kind of plot of what I'm doing. Um, so just also briefly in terms of this, I think is something 
to bear in mind in that we talk a lot about um, the kind of effects of marginalization and the effects of erasure from narratives of the past, but in terms of the current very real possibility of genocide in northern Syria, I think that's an extreme example in that the Turkish state is carrying out the same agenda towards the Kurdish people that it has been carrying out for decades, um, which is basically a denial um, for the Kurdish people to exist as a people with a history, a language, a political expression and a future. Okay, so I'm going to talk very briefly about mutual aid and solidarity and I'm going to try and give like four kind of ideas of what this would look like for our villages working with marginalized communities. And none of these are, like, this is not me inventing the wheel. None of these are ideas that nobody in archaeology has talked about before. I'm just trying to, like, put them out there so that we can pick up on them when we're having a discussion. So, mutual aid um, as an idea is often summed up as solidarity, not charity. It's fundamentally um, an idea that comes from anarchist theory. Um, based on cooperation, solidarity and reciprocity and Peter Krobotsky and I'll stop with the, with the theory as soon as I've begun but um, he basically saw it as a fundamental aspect of human social life and he identified forms of mutual aid um, in kind of all human societies that have ever existed which is an interesting thing for archaeologists to think about um, and I'm going to just briefly talk about Scott Crow, who is an American organiser and an anarchist who was very involved in organising mutual aid after um, Hurricane Katrina, so organising kind of relief aid in this moment of extreme crisis when the state actually kind of just disappeared and didn't know what to do to help people. So Scott Crow gave a talk earlier this year, which you can actually find online if you Google Scott Crow Mutual Aid, it's on YouTube. Um, he gave a talk on the importance of the kind of emotional commitment to thinking about um, the freedom and liberty of each person you're working with in moments of crisis. So thinking of solidarity and aid as something that is supposed to expand people's options and not in terms of kind of an individualist idea of freedom, but in terms of building collectivity and community, which then builds these different forms of autonomy where you can start to like figure out ways in which to get out of like an extreme moment of crisis. Um, and that means you can start coming up with your own priorities, you can figure out what people's needs are, you can kind of build together to try and, to try and solve those issues. Um, and what that means is obviously a recognition of the skills and knowledge that exist in communities and what impact those can have on, on your options in different situations, which obviously is something that is always good to bear in mind when doing research anyway. And again, loads of projects that kind of function along these lines of working closely with communities do exist in archaeology um, and not coming up with something brand new. Um, so in terms of my four kind of basic ideas that I think would contribute to being able to build these kind of mutual aid networks within archaeological research. Um, I'm just going to like bust through these because I know I don't have loads of time. So the first would be a commitment to protecting the communities that we work with, not in a health and safety way, not in a paternalistic kind of, you know, I know what's best for you, I will protect you from, you know, whatever outside threat kind of way, but understanding the dynamics that exist in working with that community, understanding the different threats that they may face, understanding the potential repercussions of the research that we're doing, and trying to modify our behaviours and our methods according to that. The second would be um, providing material support and practical solidarity to the communities that we work with. Um, this could be in terms of funding, equipment or access, or literally anything else. Those were the things I wrote down while I was having lunch. Um, and there's no need to think of this in terms of archaeological terms or even kind of research academic kind of terms. It could be organising like regular community meals, helping support a fundraiser, different forms of kind of material engagement with the needs of a community. Um, 
The third one is collaborative methods from start to finish. So from beginning to end, kind of building projects um, which work really deeply with communities and try and respond to specific things that that come out of those communities and obviously recognising that there might be contradicting views as well that you're having to work with. So building these processes of, of discussion and consensus decision making within that work. And the final one is having research aims. So the kind of ultimate reason for the project to exist, um, to be something that are supported um, and agreed with the community. So obviously all of this is stuff that, you know, none of us come up with projects um, without any input anyway. And also I think that we have to recognize the limitations that come with working with funders and various institutions, um, which obviously are somehow not super enthused by <laughs> letting <laughs> giving over control um, to people who have, you know, in their view, nothing to do with academia. Um, so obviously I know none of this is easy and I would be really interested to hear about people's experiences trying to navigate all of this because this is something that I don't actually have that much experience with because Zoom's just letting me do whatever I want. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I guess the... I'm like, responsible supervisor. <laughs> <laughs> But I guess, like, ultimately, the the thing that kind of links all of these four things together is trying to think of our roles as beyond archaeologists, beyond researchers, um, trying to figure out how our relationships with the people we work with can be more human and a bit less institutional. Um, and then, I guess, ultimately, the, the main and final thing, as I have one minute left, um, <laughs> is trying to build into every stage of what we do constant communication with people um, on various different levels, various different platforms, um, and just making that like a really fundamental part of how we do our work.